Shabbat Shalom, everybody. It is a Shabbat. <coughs> so happens Yom Kippur falls on Shabbat, and it becomes a Shabbat at sunset, which is <coughs> 630. So it won't be long. <coughs> I just have a few announcements I want to make to begin with. As you know, we are now starting a new year. And we have our calendar that is available all the way to <clears throat> 2026. So you can know when the appointed times are. How many of you know this is an appointed time? Yes, yes. That means God said he wants to meet with us at this time. And your obedient servants who are here, especially all those online that are watching from all over the world. But for the locals here, I have a couple announcements. Tomorrow, here, this is the 11th Friday. Tomorrow, we're not going to meet here. And all of you online, uh, you can watch tomorrow morning if you want to. We're going to have this service live streamed. Well, then next week on the 16th, we're going to celebrate the Feast of Sukkot at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. If you want, you get your lulavs and etrogs today because we have them. Some will come Wednesday night and pick them up. But your etrogs stay on the counter the lulavs have to go in the refrigerator. So keep the lulavs in the refrigerator until Wednesday when you come. Uh, you can put them together if you want to. It's always nice to have them already put together. But the office is going to be closed tomorrow or, or the next day because the first day of Sukkot is a holiday and the last day of Sukkot is a holiday. So the offices will be closed so there's no manna time. So all of you that come to manna time know there will be no manna time. And on uh, Shabbat for the next couple of weeks, there is no Torah club either on Shabbat. Now, this, the 19th, uh, is the Torah portion, Vazot HaBraka, and we'll be talking about Shemini Atzeret, which means the eighth day of Sukkot. But we're going to have a big party here. All right, so next Shabbat, you can bring some side dishes or whatever. We'll have a barbecue outside, and it'll be a lot of fun. And then, of course, this week, we begin with Breshit, the Torah portion. We start the cycle over. We start with Genesis. Okay, so no man of time uh, those two days. Party, party. Okay, I believe on Tuesdays, we'll still be open, and there will be the prayer time. And then, Jill, are you ready? Okay. There's been, uh, we have the new uh, Mark Bilt's Phonetic New Testament, where those of you that want to can easily learn Hebrew. Uh, we believe this to be the number one most scholarly, literally translated online Bible for the 21st century, where we're going to restore the language, keep the spirit. But like I said, it is online only, but you need to activate it. We have about 300 people that bought them, but 80 of them haven't activated it yet. And so we're concerned some people aren't as, you know, computer savvy as others, and they may not know how to activate it. So for the 80 of you online or here that need to activate it, we have a short video we want you to watch that will help you activate it. Let me show you how it really works. So you see here the first screen, okay? This is the first screen. And you see the whole books of the Bible in that screen, very clear, very nice. And since they don't include everything, you scroll down a little bit. You see, you can scroll up and you can scroll down and you can see them all. Let me show you the example. Let's say you want to check the book of Matthew. All you need to do is click on the word Matthew. You don't see my finger, but I'm clicking on the word Math St. Matthew. And here it is. You can see all the chapters of that book laid out in front of your eyes. Very simple and very easy. So let's go to chapter one. All you need to do is click on chapter one. And it pops up right there. And now you can see what's special in the way that the Mark Bills Bible is written. So look at the first verse. And, if, and it's already done with very large and nice characters. But if you want it bigger, and I know and I appreciate, and some people do need to see very large text, just touch the screen and make it bigger. Look, look at the size, and it stays very sharp, and it's wonderful. And you can use it in anything. You can use it on your computer, on your laptop, 
on your um, iPads and so on, lab, and, you know, tablets and so on. You can make it bigger at any time. But a very special feature, which you call the pillar, a pillar of the Mark Biltz Bible, is the audio that is added. This is the teaching of Pastor Mark that he's been teaching me for many years too, and he's been teaching millions of people, if I can say, hundreds of thousands, some people say, but I think it's millions throughout the years, all over the world, in hundreds of countries. And basically what he does, he's been teaching that, and we took all his teaching throughout about 30 years or so, and we put it built into the Bible. This is really, without a doubt, the world, world's first built-in audio commentaries. So you read your Bible, and you go, and you see here number one. You can see my finger, but in number one, you see a picture of a speaker. So you touch it once. Look, I'm touching it once. Here we are, opening a book, talking about the generation of Jesus Christ. You'll notice above and the you word can hear Pastor Mark. I'm not going to play the whole thing. This is the commentary of Pastor Mark Hebrew, that's on the more than first just verse. It's all so the to stories. stop it, you scroll down. You can see there is a button called "Stop and Audio." You will notice Jesus it's the red Christ one on the right hand side. Is actually in the moment I click it, it stops. There is another way to stop. Let's play it again. Verse one. Here we are, okay. opening a book, Scroll down. talking about the and let's generation say you don't want to do that. You just go to Christ. the next page. Look at the right arrow, above the, word the blue arrow on the right the side. Word. You click it once, and it goes to the second page automatically, and starting for verse 6, and it stops the sound. So you don't need to bother about stopping the sound. If you want to go on, you just stop the sound. You can hear it again and again. So in this page, there is no audio, but you go to the next page, and here it is on verse 17. So you click on verse 17. Wow. And you can In verse hear 17, the audio. it's talking all about generations or told dotes. But and let's what say do we something, see you know, you want to read now a different book. David and to and the again, carrying you can away make of Babylon it bigger is 14 at any generations. Time. And you and want from to. And the carrying away into Babylon unto the Messiah. And you want to read a different book. You go What's down. The deal with the you see the menu. Well, guess and you what? see, and then it David's says Bible books, and you have it also on the, the top. Value when you scroll, you see, you click on Bible six. books, and you get to the same menu that you have all the books in the Bible. <clears throat> I have here that you need to activate. I thought I was going to show you how to activate it, but if any of you... Have it. Don't be frustrated. Call the office and uh, we will help you activate it because it doesn't do any good to have it and not use it. Okay, so as I said, next week, the Feast of Tabernacles uh, is Wednesday night, October 16th. Two services. Pick your fun, five and seven. And then, of course, tonight starts Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So with that said, we're going to stand and we're going to open with some prayers. Uh, we always start with the Shehekianu, and let's begin. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehekianu, Vekiyamanu, Vehigianu, Lazman Hazeh. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has supported us, protected us, and brought us to this season. Amen. Together. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malchuto Le'olam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be the name of his glorious sovereignty forever and ever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them thoroughly to your children. And you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, 
when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for a reminder between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. And now from the Amidah, for the Messianic king, speedily cause the offspring of your servant David to flourish, and let him be exalted by your saving power, for we wait all day long for your salvation. Blessed are you, O Lord, who causes salvation to flourish, and for repentance. Bring us back, our Father, to your instruction. Draw us near our King to your service, and cause us to return to you in perfect repentance. Blessed are you, O Lord, who delights in repentance for forgiveness. Forgive us, our Father, for we have sinned. Pardon us, our King, for we have transgressed. For you pardon and forgive. Blessed are you, O Lord, who is merciful and always ready to forgive. Amen. And uh, Jill's going to play a couple of songs of worship, and we'll get into the teaching.
Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Wow, how exciting. For how many of you is this your very first Yom Kippur here at El Shaddai? All right. You are going to love it. I promise you that. We're going to begin with the fact that Yom Kippur really is Yom Kippurim. That means it's like Purim. That's what it means. And so in one sense, how is it like Purim? Well, in Purim, everyone wears a mask. And then they take the mask off. Well, here, no matter what mask we put on during the year, the Lord takes our masks off and we get to see who we really are, what we're really like. And this is like one of the holiest days of the entire year. And for you to imagine, so much happened on this day. I will go over. We are literally experiencing the anniversary of a very historic event when Moses came down the mount with the tablets. That happened to, on this day. So Yom Kippurim means, like I said, Ki Purim, which means like Purim. But let's look at Leviticus 16, 29 through 34. It says, it'll be a statute forever in the seventh month on the 10th day of the month. That's today. Today is the 10th at 630. All right. It says, what are we to do? Where to our afflict? Our souls do no kind of work. And this uh, was not only for the native born, but it was also for the stranger who lives as a foreigner among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you from all your sins. You shall be clean before the Lord. Now, how many of you know God's holy? Not only is he holy, he's holy, holy, holy. We're just, you know, to be holy or set apart. 
But can you imagine what it is going to be like when we all enter into God's presence, who is holy, 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 and we see ourselves? And uh, compared to him, uh, we, have, we are no comparison. You know, we're got most, everyone's going to want to run and hide. But uh, it says that it is a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you're to afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. Now, how you afflict your soul is up to you. There are certain things, such as fasting, which isn't mentioned here. Okay, but guess what? We're going to talk about the story of Jonah. And the events of Jonah had happened during up to Yom Kippur. And they fasted. They afflicted themselves. But let's keep going. It says, the priest who was anointed and who was consecrated to be priest in his father's place, he's the one to make atonement. He shall put on the linen garments, even the holy garments. This refers to the white garments that we have on. And in Israel, the high priest had to make atonement for himself first, then his family, and then for all the children of Israel. Nowhere does Yom Kippur refer to Gentiles. Yom Kippur is specifically an Israel event for them to make atonement so that on Sukkot, they could make atonement for the nations of the world. That's why they would kill 70 bulls during Sukkot to make atonement for the 70 nations. So this is specifically an event for Israel. And people say, well, why are we here? Okay, first off, we know that white linen, you know, is the righteousness of the saints. That's what it says in Revelation. <clears throat> but because it is for the nation of Israel, this is the one day we want to intercede for Israel. I don't know if you've heard today what happened over in Iran. There was one of the largest major cyber attacks on everything in Iran. I mean, uh, the government, everything, even their nuclear facilities, major, major cyber attack on Iran today. And some people believe it is a prelude to an all-out attack by Israel tomorrow. Now, they were attacked on Yom Kippur in 73, and it looks like they may... So we need to be praying for Israel specifically this particular weekend. But I want you to notice this. It says... He shall make atonement for the sanctuary. What? Moses' tabernacle had to be atoned. He was to make a atonement for the tent of meeting, for the altar. He's to make atonement for the priests, for all the people of the assembly. And this will be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel. Notice this isn't for the Gentiles. Once in the year, because of all their sins, and it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, how many of you, I don't know if you knew this, but during Yeshua's time, there were many priests that weren't the son of Aaron. They were handpicked by Herod. Herod would just pick a priest here, a priest there, and they had to go on Yom Kippur to do all of the necessary things for Israel to get atonement. A lot of them had no clue what they were supposed to do. And so priests would stay up with that high priest all night long and not let him fall asleep to make sure he did it right. And in the temple, there was cold marble floors and everyone had to be barefoot. And so all night long, they're making this high priest get up on his bare feet, walk across a cold marble floor and make sure he knew how to do it. Otherwise, Israel wouldn't be atoned for. How would you like to have your forgiveness dependent on some loony bin that doesn't know what he's doing. And everyone's dependent that he does it right. Well, guess what? That's to make us realize we have to depend on a high priest who knows what he's doing. Okay, that's very important. I don't have time to go into it uh, in my notes, but I don't know if you knew this. They would tie a red sash around the Azazel the goat that they would send out into the wilderness. Well, <clears throat> all the cities around didn't want their sins coming to their city, and they said, come get your goat. <laughs> or, so what they ended up doing is shoving the goat off a cliff so it would die. And they say that when the 
goat died, they also tied a red sash on the temple doors and it would turn white miraculously. And that's how they knew their sins were forgiven. But guess what? After 30 AD, for 40 years until the temple was destroyed, it never turned white again. That's some just historical facts that is written in Jewish literature from that day. So let's go to Leviticus 25, 8 through 11. Here it says, seven Sabbaths of years are be, to be numbered for you. Seven times seven years, the day, even the days of seven Sabbath of years, which comes to 49 years. Now look what it says. And then uh, it says, then let the loud horn be sounded far and wide on what day? The 10th day of the seventh month. That's the day. So that means the year of Jubilee is always and only proclaimed on Yom Kippur for that year. And then it says, on the day of taking away sin, let the horn be sounded through all your land. Let that 50th year be kept holy and proclaim publicly that everyone in the land is set at liberty and freed from their debt. It is the Jubilee, and every man may go back to his heritage, to his family. Let this 50th year be the Jubilee. Okay, who remembers the very first Yom Kippur in the Bible? What happened on the very first Yom Kippur? Well, let's do a rehearsal. Let's go back with our collective memory. And here's the other thing. How long did Moses spend before the Lord? 40 days. And then what else? Did he do it again? What? For 40 more days? And did he do it again? For another 40 days? Well, let's look at what the Bible says. In Exodus 24, 18, Moses went into the midst of the cloud, got him up to the mount, and Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And then, this was at Shavuot, or Pentecost, he goes up, and on the 17th day of Tammuz, he comes down, and what are they doing? Worshiping the golden calf. So we look at Exodus 32, 19. It came to pass, as soon as he came near to the camp, he saw the calf, the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the table or the tablets out of his hands and broke them beneath the mount. So there's his first 40 days, okay? And after 17th of Tammuz. Then what happened? This is a verse almost no one sees because it's not in the book of Exodus. It's in the book of Deuteronomy when he's rehearsing what happened. And I have here the chart. 40 days, it says in Exodus 24, 18, immediately he falls on his face in Deuteronomy 9, 17, and 18, and he fasts for another 40 days. Well, he's there before the Lord 40 days, and he fasts. It doesn't say he fasts the 40 days here. We don't know if he fasted. It does say he fasted 40 days here. <clears throat> Look at your notes, Deuteronomy 9, 17, and 18. He says, I took the two tablets and cast them out of my two hands that broke them before your eyes. I fell down before the Lord as at the first 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread or drank water because of all your sins, which you sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Wow. He <clears throat> came down, smashed the golden calf, reproved him. We know 3,000 died and all of this. And a day or two later, <clears throat> boom, he's on the ground. He even moves the tent of meeting out of the camp to outside the camp. And he's communing with God there. And then <clears throat> you'll notice in Exodus 34, 28, he goes back up for another 40 days. All right. And that's when he comes down on Yom Kippur. On this very day, he comes down. So <clears throat> that's kind of exciting when you realize that. Okay. Now, look at, this is really important. In Genesis, nope, I'm on the wrong page. Yeah, Exodus 34, 28, you'll see where he says he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread or drank water. And this time he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Can you imagine fasting for 80 days, no bread or water? You know, that was a miracle. Okay, then 
what do we see? Look at Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 2. The Lord tells Moses to tell Aaron, his brother, that he doesn't come at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark that he doesn't die, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. If you remember, on the first day of Nisan was a grand opening ceremony in the tabernacle, and Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's two sons, died. That kind of crashes the party. Okay? Why? What do we see from here? We see they could only go into the Holy of Holies, where the ark was, how many times? On Yom Kippur. Okay, so on Yom Kippur is the only time the priest could see the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? Now, look at Revelation eleven nineteen. I'm going to tie what's going to happen prophetically on this day. You have to understand the Torah. It, God says in Isaiah 25, 1, he declared the end from the beginning. So you've got to study the beginning to know what's going to happen at the end. Does that make sense? Well, look at this. In Revelation eleven nineteen. 19, the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in its temple the Ark of the Covenant. And there was lightning and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Well, guess what? Now that you know that, what day is this going to occur? Yom Kippur. This event in Revelation eleven nineteen 19 will occur on this day some year. This is why you have to get on God's calendar. Then when you read, you can see the pattern. Now look at Revelation 12, 10. I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Messiah. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Well, you know what's exciting. Here we see day and night. Here's the accuser of the brethren called Hasatan, which means the adversary, accusing us day and night. But the letters that spell Hasatan add up to 364. And there's one day every year he has to shut up, and that's Yom Kippur. This is awesome. This is the day we go, wahoo, I am forgiven, which is very good. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's go to Leviticus 16.4. He has to put on all white. He puts on a linen coat, and he'll have the linen breeches, and he has a linen girdle, and a linen turban. Shall he be attired? These are holy garments. Therefore, shall he wash his flesh and water, and so put them on. One thing I just want to bring out, you can see he had to put on a holy turban. A lot of the priests had hats. It's okay for men to wear hats. It's okay for men. Even the priests had to have a hat on. Okay, moving on. <laughs> okay, now this, we're going to tie this to the book of Revelation now like you've never seen. Watch the pattern. Leviticus 16 and 17, it says, I should say head covering, not have a head covering. But anyway, look at this. How many people are to be in the tabernacle? None. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement, here we go, for himself, for his house, and for the congregation of Israel. Okay, so no one can go in the tabernacle, right? Now, do you have to remember Moses' tabernacle is patterned after one in heaven, which means there's a tabernacle in heaven. So when we read Revelation, John is seeing what's going on in heaven. How many people can go in the tabernacle when the high priest goes in? Let's read Revelation chapter 15, verse 6 through 8. The seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues. They're clothed in pure and what? White linen. Huh, that sounds like a Yom Kippur event. Having their breasts girded with the golden girdles, one of the four beasts gave to the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. 
When does this happen, this event? It's Yom Kippur. When you're on God's calendar and you know the patterns, you know you can date these events. We don't know what year, but once it starts rolling, it's time to start counting. Now, then, here we have Genesis chapter 45, verse 1. Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, cause every man to go out from me, and there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. Yom Kippur event. I can prove that. He comes out of the pit on Rosh Hashanah, and the Bible says that. Most people don't realize it. And now it is on Yom Kippur. No one can be among the children of Israel when Joseph removes his Purim mask, and they recognize who he is. Now, let me ask you this. Why do the Jews not recognize Yeshua today? Now, do you remember? None of them could recognize him. The, none of the tribes could recognize Joseph. How come they couldn't recognize him? He looked Egyptian. He talked Egyptian. And why don't the Jews recognize Yeshua today? Because we are presenting a Egyptian Greek Jesus. This is why they don't recognize him. Not only that, he's done away with the law. And, and Christians wonder why the Jews don't get it. It's because they don't get it. Now, and again, this literally happened on Yom Kippur. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 35. God says, I, this is a prophecy that has not happened yet. But it says, I'm going to bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there I will plead with you how? Yom Kippur is the only day where it's called face to face. Because the high priest goes in, he's in the Holy of Holies once a year. This tells you this will happen some year on Yom Kippur. Now, what is the purpose of Yom Kippur? Rosh Hashanah on the first, a lot will happen on that day. I spoke about it at the Rosh Hashanah ceremony. And the whole world has to recognize God as king. And that is literally when the tribulation will begin. It'll begin on Rosh Hashanah at the beginning of a seven-year Shemitah cycle. Okay? After the tribulation begins, Yom Kippur, this is the very day Israel will realize Yeshua is the Messiah. It is on this day that they're going to realize he's the Messiah. And then what we're going to celebrate next week, the Feast of Sukkot or Tabernacles, is when God tabernacles among men for the thousand-year reign. And it has to happen in order. So let's go to Leviticus. I'm going to bring up this little next picture here. All these are from the Temple Institute, or a lot of them are. And look at what it says. Aaron has to bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself in his house, and kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And then it says he has to take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands have to be full of sweet incense, beaten, small and bring it within the veil. He has to put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony so he doesn't die. And he takes of the blood of the bull and he sprinkles it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat till he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. So I have this picture. He's done all that. He's sprinkling the... And how many plagues are there? Seven plagues. Okay, and how many trumpets? Seven trumpets. Okay, now let's see if they do this up in heaven. I have another picture here of the heavenly angel at the altar of incense that's in heaven. It says in Revelation 8, 3 through 6, another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. There was given to him much incense that he would offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar before the throne and the smoke of the incense came with the prayers of the saints ascending up before God out of the angel's hand. And then it says, the angel took the censer, filled it with fire of the altar. That's the exact phrase of what we just read in Leviticus. 
He cast it to the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake that we read earlier. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. So do you see how there's a heavenly temple and there's an earthly sanctuary? On this day right now, they are practicing the book of Revelation. What's going to happen? Every year on this day, they do a dress rehearsal. That's going on right now. And what do we see in Leviticus uh, 16, 18, and 19? He goes to the altar. That's before the Lord. He makes atonement for it. He takes the blood of the bull and of the blood of the goat, puts it on the horns of the altar, and he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Now, why do we wear white? Look at Isaiah 118. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. This is why they tied a red sash on the temple door. And when it turned white, they knew God accepted them. Let's look at Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. The marriage of the lamb is come. How many of you want to be at the marriage? It says his wife has made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So here she is in white linen and guess what day this event happens? Wow, what a concept. And look at this. I'm going to bring you this picture now. Look at this picture. This speaks of Revelation 19, 11 through 16. He sees heaven opened up, a white horse. He that sits upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness, he's judging and making war. His eyes were a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. That happens on Rosh Hashanah. We crown him king. And it says that no, he had a name written no one knew, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God. The armies which are in heaven following him were upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. What day is this event going to happen? Yom Kippur. And out of his mouth goes your sharp sword that with it, he'll smite the nations. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his side a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You have to get in your mind, this event will happen on this day, some year. Look at Isaiah 63, 1 through 4. Who is this that's coming from Edom in crimsoned garments from Botra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength, it is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. And why is your apparel red and your garment like him who has treaded in the winepress? And he says, I've trodden the winepress alone. And from the nations, there was no one with me. Yom Kippur, again, this is something Yeshua is our high priest. And he is doing this alone. This is a Yom Kippur event. I tread them in my anger, trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood was spattered on my garments and stained all of my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption had come. If you remember when he started his ministry, he quoted Isaiah, but he didn't read the day of vengeance. He stopped in the middle of that verse Because this is the day of vengeance when he returns. Zechariah 3, 8 and 9. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and all your fellows that are sitting before you. You are men wondered at. Behold, I will bring forth my servant. And what's his name? That refers to Yeshua. For behold, the stone that I've laid before Joshua on one stone will be seven eyes. Behold, I'll engrave the graving thereof, says the Lord of hosts. And look at this. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. When is that one day he'll remove the iniquity? Yom Kippur. Okay. Are we having fun yet? Why is the book of Jonah read every year on Yom Kippur? Tomorrow, if you have time, read the book of Jonah. It's not very long. Why? Or what do we learn from the story of Jonah? 
What is the book about? What is Jonah about? Repentance, right? But Nineveh repented, but Jonah never did. Nor does he apologize. You're going to see this. It should be called the book of Jonah, not the book of Nineveh. The focus really isn't on Nineveh's repentance. Both the book of Jonah and Yom Kippur are about more than repentance. My question now is, who was Jonah? We know he was the son of Amittai. What does that mean? It comes from the word Emmet, which means I am the son of truth. I am the son of faithfulness. That's who I am. Well, let's see. In 1 Kings, I'll also tell you, here's a story that many don't know who Jonah actually was. Remember, Paul Harvey, whoever it was, now comes the rest of the story. I'm going to give you the rest of the story. First off, in 1 Kings 17, 1, how many of you have heard of Elijah, the Tishbite? He was of the inhabitants of Gilead, and he said unto Ahab, remember Ahab and Jezebel? Okay. As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there will not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And then we go down to verse 8 and 12. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get you to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. So Elijah rose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, there was this widow woman who was gathering sticks, and he called to her. And he said, hey, fetch me, I pray you, a little water in a vessel that I can drink. As she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, hey, bring me, I pray you, a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we can eat it and then die. So then what happens? Let's go to 1 Kings 17, verse 17 through 22. It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, he fell sick and his sickness was so sore there was no breath left in him. And she says to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O you man of God? Are you come to me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode. And he laid him upon his own bed and he cried to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, have you also brought evil? Now, I want you to remember that phrase. Brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son. And he stretches himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, I pray you let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came in unto him again. And he revived. Now look at 1 Kings 17, 24. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are men of God, that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. It was Jonah. This, the boy that Elijah raised from the dead was Jonah, who lived exactly during this time frame. Wow. That's, and he's called the son of truth. Now, but wait, there's more. Look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of truth saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it for their evil. Okay, remember, you got done reading about brought evil upon the widow. And here it says, their evil has come up before me. But what did Jonah do? He rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Well, if he's Mr. Faithful Prophet, why is he running? Why did he sign up for the prophet business? Okay, he's not being faithful or true to the calling. And notice, when he does this, he's always going down. And he's going down. As a matter of fact, look at Jonah 1, 4, and 5. 
But the Lord hurled a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea. The ship was likely to be broken. The mariners were afraid. They cried every man to his God. And they cast forth their wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten them. But Jonah, he's going down. He's continually going down into the innermost part of the ship. And he lay and was fast asleep. And then look, in Jonah 2, 6, I went down to the bottom of the mountains. He's going down and down. Here, Jonah, why is he running away? If he's supposed to be a prophet of God, he gets a direct order, but he flees. Being a prophet, why would he think he could get away with running away anyway? Surely he knows he can't run from God. Why is he trying to run? Does anyone know why he's trying to run? Nineveh was the strongest city. And my goodness, Nineveh just got done attacking and killing a bunch of Jews. How many of you would love to have your most hated enemy repent? and not suffer a consequence. This is his problem. He says, I know you, God, you're going to forgive him, and I can't stand that. This is the problem. It's just like if we'd want the Ayatollah of Iran to repent. I mean, just, I want you to think about this. Jonah does not want Nineveh to repent, so he's on the run. And then Jonah 3, 1 through 3, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I told you. So Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Okay, remember the old whale threw him back up and then how long did it take him to get to Nineveh after the whale threw him up? Well, let's take a look here. First off, whales are not going to be found here. Whales are going to be out here. He leaves from Yaffa or Yaffa, Tel Aviv. He gets thrown up over here. But look where Nineveh is. Okay, he's got to get all the way to Nineveh. Now, I want you to know Nineveh is 830 miles away. How many of you want to walk 830 miles or ride a camel or a donkey 830 miles by car, 15 hours, 17 hours, 18 hours, depending on what route you take to Mosul, which is modern day Nineveh. But I wanted you to realize he's walking in a pool of whale vomit for 40 days or whatever, all over his clothes stink, and he may have taken a bath. But let's take a look. I just wanted you to get a picture. And then here <clears throat> he's on the ocean. And there's this great storm of wind and everyone's getting afraid. And he ends up in Nineveh. So now he comes. Now let's look at this. Jonah 3, 7 through 10. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble saying, let neither man nor beast herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let them be covered with sackcloth, both man and beast, and let them cry mightily unto God. Let them turn everyone from what? His evil way. And from the violence that is in their hands, who knows whether God will not turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So God repents of the evil, which he had said he would do to them, and he did it not. Boy, was Jonah upset. Wow. And I don't know if you know this. There's a prophecy I can show you that in Persia, Iran, they are all going to repent and come to the Lord. And it even says he will also set his thr uh, throne in Elam, which is part of Iran. Let's go on. And so what happens in Jonah 1, uh, let me see. We see Jonah goes to sleep, right? So in the midst of this storm, it is God trying to talk to Jonah, but Jonah says, I'm not talking to you. I'm going to sleep. And so the captain comes and says to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise and call out to your God, perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. 
here, Jonah 1, 6 through 8. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they all said one to another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. Notice how the word evil is tied to Jonah all through this. But now let me connect the dots. Go to Ephesians 5, 13 and 14. When anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. This is referring to Jonah. It's to believers who are running from God for one reason or another. And Messiah will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We got to know what time it is. If we don't know what time it is, we're not going to be aware of what God is trying to accomplish. So the captain says, you come and pray to your God. Well, does Jonah pray? No, he has nothing to say to God. What does he say to the crew? Kill me. That was his solution. And Jonah 1, 12, he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. And like I said, the nightmare happens for Jonah. They repent. God forgives. So look at Jonah 4, 1 through 3. It displeased Jonah exceedingly that they repented. And he was angry and he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray you, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my own country? Therefore, I fled beforehand to Tarsus, for I knew that you are a gracious God and compassionate, long suffering, abundant in mercy, and repenteth thee of the evil. Therefore, now, O Lord, take, I beseech you, my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. Jonah's the one who never repents. On Yom Kippur, the 40 days that he was prophesying to Nineveh was the first of a lull till Yom Kippur. And he's the one that needs to be asking for forgiveness. Nineveh did on Yom Kippur. God forgave them. Now, where have we heard these attributes before where God is gracious and compassionate and long-suffering? Well, let's go to Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed by before him, before Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God. And guess what he is? He's merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. So here we are in our cycle again, bringing us back even at the same time that this was declared. So this is God's name of compassion in saving Israel from their evil and from them being destroyed after the sin of the golden calf. This is God's name. And Jonah is quoting this verse, but with a different tone. In his mind, forgiveness is evil. How can you forgive these nation of people that I hate God? Forgiveness becomes evil. And in his mind, forgiveness is evil, and Jonah even stops in his description of God's character. He doesn't say the whole thing. Why? Because the next word is truth. Emmet. Amatai. Emmet. It's personal here. He's accusing God of not being a God of truth. He changes his mind from doing evil. God changes his mind. I don't want to do evil. And Jonah, like I have right here, Emmet, is truth. Emmet is truth. What happens when you put the letter Yud at the end of that word? It becomes my truth. He's the son of my truth, and my truth ain't your truth. Where are we today? Truth 
as my truth and you have your truth. Is there any true truth? This is speaking of events in our day at this time. So Jonah is running from God saying, no, will there be no justice? Where is truth in that, he says. He is not just trying to escape the mission, but trying to run from God. And now Jonah wants to die because of God's mercy. All right, so here we are. He's in Nineveh. All right. Oh, let me see. Yeah. And what does he do? Look at Jonah 4, 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there he made a booth and sat under its shadow till he might see what would become of the city. What is the Hebrew word for booth? Exactly. It's Sukkot. From Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, the court of heaven is in session. And then from Yom Kippur through Sukkot, judgment is meted out. He is sitting under his sukkah seeing if God is going to judge Nineveh. He wants to see the fun begin. Okay, so here, most people don't catch it. It's the code, all this whole time frame. It's right now, right now. And he is sitting in a booth that he made and he's sitting under its shadow, right? Well, it's a sukkah now. Unlike Abraham, Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, but not Jonah. Okay, let's look at Jonah 4, 6 through 8. The Lord prepared a gourd, a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be what? A shadow of his head. He didn't need a shadow of his head. He already had a shadow. But God is blessing him by giving him another shadow within the shadow. And it says to deliver him from his what? But did you know that's the wrong Hebrew translation? Can you believe it? We have a lot of English mistranslations in the Tanakh that Danny and I are fixing. Listen to this. I'll go on. I'll come back to it. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd, but what did God do? He prepared a worm, and when the morning rose, the next day, it smote the gourd that it withered, and it came to pass when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement East wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted, and he wished himself to die again. And he says, it's better for me to die than to live. Remember the trail of evil all through this book I've been showing you? Here is the correct translation of the Hebrew of Jonah 4, 6. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his evil, not his Grief from his evil. He's the one who's being evil. He didn't need the gourd for a shadow. He already had shade. Jonah does not want God to pardon any of his evil, yet God is showing mercy to Jonah, delivering him from his evil. Repentance doesn't mean you deserved to be saved. Just because you, a lot of people think, well, I repented, so I deserve to be saved. Saved. Not. If you murder somebody and you go to the court, well, I repented. You still suffer the consequences. What does saying you are sorry really accomplish? It doesn't erase your crime. It doesn't change the past. Now, I want you to listen to this phrase. The power of repentance is not and never is that it changes the past, but true repentance changes the future. If I change my ways, then I can make an argument for compassion. There is no get out of hell free Jesus card that allows you to keep on sinning unconditionally. Yeshua didn't die and shed his blood so you can continue in your rebellion and hatred of all of his laws without consequences. He died to motivate you to stop the rebellion. Repentance matters because it changes the future and God saves you because of what you can still become. Daniel 9, 3 through 6. What does Daniel say? I set my face to the Lord God to seek by prayer and petition with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God. I make confession. Now, Daniel, he probably was one of the holiest guys around, but look what he said. 
O Lord, the great and dreadful God, who keeps covenant and loving kindness with those who love him and keep his commandments. But look, he says, we, not they, we have sinned and have dealt perversely. We've done wickedly. We have rebelled, even turning aside from your precepts and from your ordinances. Neither have we listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. What we need to find out and realize from a theological point of view, the entire community rises and falls together. We are held accountable for the actions of everyone. Everyone in that boat was going to drown because of Jonah. In the traditional Jewish outlook, the fate of the individual is actually tied up with the fate of the group of which they are a part. If you remember, Achan stole a pagan idol and Israel lost, was destroyed before their enemies because of one person who stole an idol. We have to realize we have to look at everything not as, oh, I got my Jesus, I'm saved, so I don't care about everybody else. No, we have to realize if one person drills a hole in the boat, we're all going down. And so we have to be praying for one another. Now, with that said, I'm going to read a couple of verses, and then we're going to play the song, Avinu Malkainu. I'll tell you about that here in a second. But first, I want you to understand, I'm going to have some pictures up here. Here is John, Revelation 1.17. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, don't fear, I am the first and the last. And then let's go to Revelation 5, 6. What does it say? I beheld in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. So I've got this picture of a lamb that has been slain. And then what is the next verse in Revelation? And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, come here. And I saw, and behold, there was a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow. A crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And then we'll end with Revelation 20, 12. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. What day are the books opened? Rosh Hashanah. They're closed on Yom Kippur. This is telling you what John saw was an event that happened on Rosh Hashanah. And then another book opened, which was the what? Book of life. Now, I'm going to show you the words, the Avinu Malkainu, and then I'm going to play a video. This is what they're singing, because you don't know Hebrew. The Avinu Malkainu, a Malkainu, which means our father, our king. Hear our prayer. We have sinned before you. Have compassion upon us and upon our children. Help us bring an end to pestilence, war, famine. Cause all hate and oppression to vanish from the earth. Inscribe us for blessing in the book of life. Let the new year be a good year for us. The whole thing is we need, even if you think you're the most righteous person in the world, we need to be praying for one another, praying for Israel. What we're going to do now is let's all stand. We're all going to say some prayers together. We're going to start with the first one, which is known as the uh, Sham Nu. And uh, it's two slides. And what we, I want all of us to do is, even like Daniel or whatever, let's acknowledge our sins and the sins of our fathers and of our nation. Let's begin. We have trespassed. We have dealt treacherously. We have robbed. We have spoken slander. We have acted perversely. We have done wrong. We have acted presumptuously. We have done violence. We have practiced deceit. We have counseled evil. We have spoken falsehood. We have scoffed. We have revolted. We have blasphemed. We have rebelled. We have committed iniquity. We have transgressed. We have oppressed. 
We have been stiff-necked. We have acted wickedly. We have dealt corruptly. We have committed abomination. We have gone astray. We have led others astray. And now let's go on. We repent for the early church fathers who also refused to walk in your laws and led us astray by the erroneous teachings of replacement theology. For the sin which we have committed before you by hard-heartedness, for the sin which we have committed before you with immorality, for these sins, may the God who pardons, pardon us, forgive us, atone for us. And for the sin which we have committed before you openly or secretly, for the sin which we have committed before you with knowledge and with deceit, for the sin which we have committed before you by deceiving a fellow man. And for the sin which we have committed before you by improper thoughts, for all these, God of pardon, pardon us, forgive us, atone for us, for the sin which we have committed before you by disrespect for parents and teachers, and for the sin which we have committed before you by desecrating the divine name. For the sin which we have committed before you by impurity of speech, and for the sin which we have committed before you by foolish talk, for the sin which we have committed before you with the evil inclination, for all these, God, a pardon, pardon us, forgive us, atone for us, for the sin which we have committed before you by false denial and lying, and for the sin which we have committed before you by evil talk about another, for the sin which we have committed before you in business dealings, and for the sin which we have committed before you through eating and drinking, and for the sin which we have committed before you by a glance of the eye, for the sin which we have committed before you with proud looks. For all these, God of pardon, pardon us, forgive us, atone for us. For the sin which we have committed before you in passing judgment. And for the sin which we have committed before you by a begrudging eye. For the sin which we have committed before you by running to do evil. And for the sin which we have committed before you by tail bearing. And for the sin which we have committed before you by causeless hatred. For all these, God of pardon, pardon us, forgive us, atone for us. You are the pardoner of Israel and the forgiver of sins in every generation. And aside from you, we have no king who forgives and pardons. We thank you, Lord, that we have forgiveness of sins through the shed blood of Messiah Yeshua. Now the Elenu together. It is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation who has not made us like the nations of the lands nor made us like the families of the earth who has not made our portion like theirs nor our destiny like all their multitudes but we bow in worship and give thanks unto the supreme king of kings the holy one. Blessed be he who extends the heavens and establishes the earth, whose throne of glory is in the heavens above and whose presence is in the highest of heights. He is our God. There is no other. Truly, he is our king. There is none else. As it is written in the Torah, you shall know and to heart this day 
that the Lord is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. There is no other. Now, one more thing we're going to do, and this comes from Luke 1, 49. It says, for he that is mighty has done to me great things, and holy is his name. So we're going to proclaim the very names of God that Moses heard and Jonah didn't want to admit to. Together, the Lord, the Lord, Elohim, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, truth, keeper of loving kindness for thousands, forgiver of iniquities, forgiver of transgressions, forgiver of sins, the one who cleanses the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. And so now we immediately begin to look forward to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is this coming Wednesday night, again at 5 and at 7. And Jill, do you have a closing song? No? Okay, well, let's try one for the second one. Okay, let's close in prayer. Avinu Malkainu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for how much you love each and every one of us. We thank you that Yeshua came and shed his blood that we might for, be forgiven. Father, we thank you. We truly are blessed. And as we go in the righteousness and in the faith and grace of Messiah tomorrow, let us be committed to just resting, reading the book of Jonah, reading about Yom Kippur, Father, and above all, that we would love one another and work on all of our relationships. And we thank you so much that you not only want to bless us, but you want to put your name on us, even as you told Aaron to say, Ivareka Adonai Ve'ish Mareka, Ya'er Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka. You saw Adonai Panavileka Vihsem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up its countenance upon you and give you peace in that most wonderful name. Eya, Asher, Eya. Amen. We'll see you Wednesday night.